Christine, let's do this. You ready? It's Wednesday. It's Jurassic Park Day. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, I'm so excited. It's 12.05. Let's get this ball rolling. Uh, you guys, before, I know, I know we normally start with our bingo, but I actually wanted to start with something slightly different today because there was some huge Spinosaur news that came out today. And since we talked about Spinosaurs yesterday and how probably, maybe, potentially, they spend a ton of time in water, the newest research coming out of uh, Morocco. Uh, shout out to Martin for bringing up the Chem Chem beds yesterday. Wow, prescient. Uh, we found more tail material, and their tail looks a lot thicker and bigger like this, which is a good indication they probably spent a lot of time in water swimming and hunting for that lady in the nice little short skirt. Uh, so that was pretty awesome. Look that up. If you have not checked out the Spinosaur news from today, check that out. But even more importantly, this is our special JP edition bingo board for today. So remember, if and when you get five across, Diagonal, horizontal, vertical. Send a message to Christina. Grace is not here today. So all bingo boards, uh, as well as all questions, go to Christina today. And speaking of today, just like every day, we have a dino of the day. And so because we already did T-Rex and we've already done Velociraptor, I thought it was ridiculous that we haven't done this dino, which is such an important dinosaur for the entire Jurassic franchise. ba ba da ba Our dino of the day is Brachiosaurus. I wanted to include a picture of the skull here because one of the defining diagnostic features of Brachiosaurus as a sauropod is a much different type of head than kind of the flat, longer apatosaur head. It got that big bulge on the top. Uh, also, I mean, you guys know it, you love it. You've seen it in Jurassic Park. Um, I like this iteration too. Ooh. Kind of flesh it out, gave it some weird, I don't, we do, we, here we go, Christina. What, what might you refer to that as up on the front? We talk about this a lot here. On the front, oh man, that is some top-notch neck meat. Top-notch <laughs> neck meat. We're up. If you don't know this, but we are all about the neck meat here in Dino 101. Uh -huh. So I like this uh, hy hypothesized neck meat for a little size and scale. Here you go, Brachiosaurus. So this is our Dino today. I'm excited to see our drawings at the end. Uh, but perhaps, well, definitely more important even than our Dino of the day is our special guestpert of the day. Uh, where's my air horn when I need it? Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Stephen Ray Morris. Any any excuse? Yes. Stupid air horn. I like your background, Stephen. Where are you actually? I assume you're not on Isla Isla Nublar. So where are you actually zooming in from? Uh, I'm zooming in from Los Angeles, California. No, it's. I was going to say sunny Los Angeles, California, but it's not sunny right now. And I will say at a very serendipitous moment walking over here, because uh, I saw a coyote using the stairs behind my building. So I feel like that was a, a good sign. Nature, life finding a way, all life that good stuff. Life finds a way. Yeah. <laughs> bingo square. Bingo square. That is a bingo square. Good reminder. Um, Stephen, we're going to talk a little bit more in a minute about exactly who you are and what you do. Uh, but first, we obviously have to play everybody's favorite game, Dino or Not a Dino. So Stephen, here's how this works. I have a list, it's written down right here. I'm going to read you the name of 10 different animals. Yes, okay. Some of which are actual real dinosaurs and some of which I have totally made up. And your job is simply to try to figure out if it's a real dinosaur or if it's made up dinosaur. If you need help, you can uh, poll the audience by just looking okay. around the Zoom room. You got some okay. smart kiddos that are gonna give you thumbs up or thumbs down. If you want a spelling at any point, I'm happy to spell the name. Okay. Uh, also, just like every day, there is a theme for the not dinos, and you get okay. special bonus point kudos if you can figure out what the theme of the not dinos is. Okay. All right. I'm into this. All right, Stephen, are you ready to play Dino or not a Dino? I'm. I'm. I was born to play. More than probably anyone else I know. That is fair. That is facts. Here we go. Let's dig in. Dinosaur number one. Barsboldia. Barsboldia. Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with my gut on this one. I'm gonna say not a dinosaur. You're gonna go not not even pulling the audience, just going straight, not a dinosaur. Steven, you're starting 0 for 1 because Barboldia is an actual dinosaur. That is okay. Okay, all right. All right. Oftentimes our experts start poorly and then pick up the slack. I gotta I gotta you know, I gotta feel it out, you know. You gotta feel it out. Uh, all right, number two. Barsboldia is a dinosaur. You've got that one wrong. That's okay. Number two, Pravenator. Ooh, wow, these are, you are going with Pravenator. Listen, I, apparently I've been making this too easy the last few, so this one might be a little Oh, tough. no. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, 
Jada's got a thumbs down. I see Megan's got a thumbs down. Look, I, I went with my gut last time and it was wrong. So I'm going to go with what the audience is saying and I'm going to say no. You're saying not no, a, Cravenator's not a dinosaur. Yeah. That is correct. Cravenator's okay. not a dinosaur. Okay. One and one. <laughs> okay. Back at, back at right. 50%. Papasaurus. P A W P A W Saurus. Papasaurus. <sighs> Well, okay, so pray. I'm going to say I'm going to say no cuz I have an, I, I'm thinking about a theme, so I'm going to say no. Okay. Uh that actually is a dinosaur. Damn. Ah. Uh, it's a dinosaur. I'm, I'm all I'm all backwards today. Okay. It's all right. You got you got plenty of time. You're one you got one right, two wrong. You only have to get 60%. D minus okay. is what. We're <laughs> yes. Doing. Shooting for a D minus. Next. Congopteryx. <laughs> I thought I knew dinosaurs. Wow, <laughs> Congopteryx. Congopteryx. <laughs> Let's see. I don't see well, any thumbs up right now. Wow, Sissy's got I, a thumbs down. Congopteryx. Congopteryx. Would you like a spelling? Sure. Okay, C O N G O P T E R Y X. Congopteryx. I'm gonna say yes. You're gonna who? Yes. But no, Congopteryx yeah. is not a dinosaur. I'm glad I've made this a little bit harder. Okay. Um, but hey, I'm, I'm learning new dinosaurs, you know? So that's what's really important, I think. Listen, you're learning- I say them, as I lose. <laughs> you're learning these new ones 45 minutes after I learned them via Wikipedia search or Google search of list of dinosaurs. Okay, uh, number five. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this. Uh, Haya, Haya, it's H-A-Y-A, Haya. Or Haya. Haya. I'm going to say yes with that one. That's, that's correct. You are correct. That okay. An actual okay. dinosaur. All right. Feeling my way. This way, that way. Left, right, left, right. I'm going. You're one, you're one away from getting back to 50-50. Next, Andromedon. <laughs> Andromedon. It's like some of these are so close, but I'm going to say no on this one. You're, Danelle is adamant this is not a dinosaur. <laughs> You're saying no, that is correct. You're now back to 50-50, okay. three correct, three Thanks, Danelle. That was the, the vigorous waving, very, I was just like, it, it's like, cl it's like close, but it's just, not, I just wasn't feeling it. That's how I try to make them. All right, next, <laughs> uh, Bonapartosaurus. Bonapartosaurus. I'm gonna look around. I'm trying to think of the theme. Um, I just feel, I mean, was there a dinosaur discovered in France and they named it? I don't think anybody would name a dinosaur after Napoleon. I'm going to say no. Yo, I wouldn't either, but apparently they did. Ah. So, Bonapartosaurus <laughs> is an actual dinosaur. All right. Wow. Uh, listen, you, for the theme, I want, you know, I can't give you any hints. I'm sorry. Next. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, okay. It's all right. It's all right. We're doing good. Next one. Spherocephaly. 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 Let me just remind you of the not dinosaurs. There was yeah, yeah. Cravenator, there was Congopteryx, Andromedon. This is Spherocephaly. We're up uh, to Spherocephaly. No. No. Spherocephaly is not a dinosaur. You're now four and four. All right, two more. You got to get both of these right. In order to get Shit. six out of ten, here we go. Santana Raptor. Santana, Santana Raptor. I'm gonna say yes. I like the uh, the confidence. That is a dinosaur. Santana Raptor <laughs> is a dinosaur. Okay. You're five and okay. four. All you have to do is get this last one correct, and you have one dino or not a dino. Last but not least, <clears throat> let me make sure I pronounce this correctly. Archaeo Proto Timelineicus. Archaeo no. proto timeline Nikes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. You sure? Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay, you are correct. That is not a dinosaur. <laughs> you did it. You got six out of ten, and you have yeah. won the right to stay in the zoom and not get booted immediately. Uh, I, uh, I feel like I I feel like I limped over the finish line with that one. It doesn't uh, matter, man. And a uh, passing grade is a passing grade. Were you able fair. to figure out the theme of the not dinos? Uh, Michael Crichton books, yeah. Yes, I, Michael I, Crichton I'm Crichton. sad that I didn't pick up on that sooner, but it, once we got to Sphere, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Michael Crichton books, I had to, I had to. It's no, no, it was perfect. Oh, I love it. All right, so that's actually a good segue. So uh, 
Stephen, who are you? Why are you here? We know you're zooming <laughs> in from uh, Cali. I have a screen. Let me share this. Hold on, just so you guys can see all of the cool stuff he does, as well as know how to get hold of Stephen. I have known Stephen uh, via the internet for a few years because mm -hmm. the dinosaur community. And I know you guys have probably really. <laughs> What's that window? Hold on. <laughs> I like the shape of Dustin's roof. <laughs> <laughs> you do a podcast called See Jurassic Right that's listed I down do. the bottom. You also make the Percast. You produce Ologies, which I know is yes. a fan fave for a lot of us yes, here. Yes, yes. Um, which is your favorite? No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> which one do I? I mean, they're all my children's. Uh, you know, it's it's such, I mean, it's, variety is the spice of life, right? You know? And it's awesome that you have like carved out a career talking about and nerding out about the things that you love, which I think yes. is like my goal too, and a lot of our goals here as big Jurassic Park nerds. And so when, uh, it was obvious when I started doing these Dino 101s that I was gonna do a Jurassic Park day. And then it was obvious that if I was gonna do that, I was gonna <laughs> try to get you up. And so Steve and I talked on the phone last night for a couple minutes, because like, if we have 40 minutes and nerd out about Jurassic Park, like in what direction are we gonna go? What exactly? Of course, yeah. About? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it kind of struck us that, you know, this is Dino 101. We have some hardcore science-y dino nerds here. We should talk about the dinosaurs specifically. And obviously, yes. we're going to talk about stuff outside of just the dinosaurs. But that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to go in order, in order of appearance in the original Jurassic Park of those dinosaurs. And today, because of our small amount of time, we're only going to talk about the original. So we're going to go in order of appearance. And we're going to talk a little bit about, well, A, the... Uh, how realistic the depictions are. But I think even more interesting is, is kind of like the actual characters these dinosaurs played because most like, or just like humans in a movie, everyone has a certain angle, everyone has a certain personality, a certain character arc and reason for being in that narrative. And the same thing, and I didn't really think about this too much until we talked last night. So I'm really excited to kind of think about like what is the reason for that type of personality and that type of character assigned to that type of dinosaur in the movie. So, Stephen, you said it right off the top of your head last night because I wasn't sure. <laughs> you remember the order of appearance of the dinos in the original Jurassic Park? Yes, it is. First off, we start with the Velociraptor at the very beginning when it's being unloaded, uh, unloaded, oh. gifted to the to the um, to the habitat that they're moving it to. Uh, and then we move on to the Brachiosaurus um, for the big reveal. And then yeah. just so slightly third is mm -hmm. the Parasaurolophus. Uh, mm -hmm. Parasa how do you, what's the plural, right, of yeah. Parasa pl the plural of Parasaurolophus? It's fun to yeah. say psi always. Parasa yeah, Parasaurolophus psi Parasaurolophus um, in the background. And then we move on to the Triceratops, the sick Triceratops. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we see the T-Rex, Rexy, a.k.a. Roberta, uh, okay. which, was the, which was the production name for the T-Rex model. Uh, I didn't know that, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah if you look that. at storyboards, it says Roberta as the T-Rex, which I think <laughs> is cute. fabulous. I like and that. then we see the Dilophosaurus, a.k.a. the Spitter, as it was referred to in a lot of the marketing material at the time. And then we round things out with the Gala, Gala, Galamimus. <laughs> Nice. All right, let's 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 do it. Since we have the order ready to go, this is our very first one. You guys probably, I mean, I hope, actually, I should, I should have done a poll. I wonder if there's anyone in this room who has not seen Jurassic Park. I'm going to- Oh, we just spoiled it the whole thing. I just, oh yeah. Also, a uh, spoiler alert, guys. There's going to be a lot of spoilers in the next 30 minutes. So I guess if you haven't watched it, turn off your screen now. All right, here we go. Here's the first one. The Literally the very first opening scene features Velociraptor. We don't see much of it, we do see that eyeball, though, coming through the uh, crate, I guess is what we're calling that. <laughs> but it's not really until some of the more iconic scenes, like in the kitchen, obviously, we see this thing in all its glory. So first, I just want to comment, you guys, we know we've talked about how Velociraptor has feathers. We know now that they definitely had feathers. We also know the Velociraptors we see in this movie are about twice as big as they actually were. They kind of switched the size of the Dilop uh, Dilophosaurus and the Velociraptor. So twice as big as they should have been. They should have had feathers. Uh, and you guys can see the arms and the hands here. We've talked a lot about how we now know theropods, the three-toed, primarily carnivorous dinosaurs, were clappers, not slappers. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe we should just turn those and pronate them in. But other than that, I mean, this movie would never have happened without the Velociraptor. So I'm curious, Stephen, like, what are your thoughts on its portrayal, like, as a personality and as a character? In this movie. Well, well, it's interesting because 
and I'm sure um, some other dino nerds, I'm sh sure you could speak to this a little bit more, but it almost seemed like in the early 90s, the theropod, the, the, the warm blood of this, these kind of new theories that kind of were around when Jurassic Park was being made, it was like, like the Velociraptor is this new, it's like the most cunning creature on the planet. And, yeah. it, and in the movie, not only is it portrayed as, it's not necessarily portrayed as a monster, like you think of like a monster movie, like a rampaging creature. It's like, you should be afraid because it is actually hunting you. It is smarter than you. It can open doors, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. And yeah, it's interesting. One of the other things that they changed in the, um, like in the early animatics, like production, like meetings and drawings, it used to have like a lizard, like a, like a lizard tongue kind of thing, but they changed oh. that because it, it's that thing of like Jurassic Park and we're going to see it again with each dinosaur. It's like this balance between realism and cinema magic. And the raptors are definitely the cunning. If, if, if the T-Rex, which we're going to talk about later, is kind of the muscle, the velociraptor is the brains. Yeah. Oh yeah. There, there's like a, a ninja-like aspect to them that I really like like smart and savvy. All right, so and that's they, Velociraptor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everyone's favorite except for Sue the T-Rex on, on Twitter who absolutely hates Velociraptor, <laughs> which is fair for reasons we'll get to in a minute. And I do believe me shouting out Sue the T-Rex is a bingo square. There it is. So, okay. All right, so first we saw the Velociraptor pretty briefly. It wasn't until later we actually get into the kitchen. But after this opening scene, relatively soon after, the next dinosaur we see in the great reveal is our friend Brachiosaurus. Brachiosaurus this is, is also our dino of the day. Uh, obviously a giant sauropod. Sauropods were the long neck, long tailed, herbivorous dinos, largest animals to ever walk the face of the earth. Uh, and this is our Brachiosaur, right? And it's not just this scene, it comes back a couple times. Um, we see it when they're in the tree and Lex gets sneezed upon. <laughs> Steven, I love what you brought up yesterday in our phone call about how this They've kind of used in the whole franchise, they've used sauropod specifically and Brachiosaurus in the first one as kind of like a vehicle to tug at the heartstrings. Oh yeah, for sure. It's in, it's interesting that they've chosen, uh, and, and maybe people can chime in on this. It's like, what is it about sauropods that, there's something, they're my favorite dinosaur. Like overall, that's my favorite group. The Brachiosaurus like is so beautiful and like, there's something about, I think maybe it's the size, the majesty that makes you kind of feel an emotion, that kind of sublimeness. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm curious for, for everybody out there, it's like, it seems like as far as popular culture goes, sauropods, it's like Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Diplodocus. And I, my th I'm putting my thinking out to everyone, like what is it about the Brachiosaurus most of all that, to me it's the shape, it's that perfect like, up the, or at least the way it's represented in the movie is right. that perfect like instead of this kind of long flat sauropod it's more of a whoop, whatever that whatever that shape is <laughs> yeah. well i mean if we go back to one of our like original ones here from our uh, dino of the day yeah i mean they're closely related to a dinosaur called giraffe titan which was named that because much like a giraffe the front legs are longer than the back and so like you just said instead of the very like brontosaurus apatosaurus flat back they're arched up into the sky which and we've talked about this is just slightly different adaptations different forms allow you to exploit different environments eat different foods that maybe other sauropods living at the same time in the same place couldn't and so it excludes that type of competition for the same food just uh, something so majestic about them do we actually i'm not sure like <laughs> I've never really thought about dinosaurs sneezing. I, it, it's it's <laughs> that they, they could have, or what, I mean, cows and horses sneeze? Well, I mean, it's, do, as far as the, the, um, the bump on the head, has that been, are those truly the actual navel cavities? Like, has that been, that's not a, um, like, that's not a cinematic invention. Well, there's a lot of debate as to where the nasal cavities actually would have been. Okay. There's a fair amount of debate as to whether or not they had a somewhat of a trunk, almost like. Ooh, I've seen I've seen drawings of that with the like, yeah. like the yeah. trunk. <laughs> of Jada's Jada's face just went insane when I mentioned that. So that is Google that. It's so wild. It's that paleo art. Art. The trunks are crazy looking. It's. it's I want to appreciate Stevens onomatopoeia. Today. The, oh, all the like. Ooh. Ooh. And <laughs> the lizard tongue sounds like. Yes. I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, the, I think the most recent thing I read about 
whether or not that was possible is based on the wear of the teeth. We think mm. it wasn't because if they were grabbing stuff in the trunk and putting it in their mouth, you'd have much more wear in the back just for chewing. But apparently, according to most of the wear patterns on front Bacchiosaurus teeth, uh, they thought they were actually using those to pluck vegetation as well. So they probably wouldn't have had a trunk. As far as the position of the nostrils go, we originally used to think, like originally like 100 years ago, they may have been at the top of their head, <laughs> started to help them breathe while in water uh. because we just didn't think an animal this size could hold up its own body weight on land. So they spent a lot of time in water with almost like that snorkel situation. Well, it, it, it's interesting because in the open, you know, in the and it transition to our next dinosaur, they kind of like like play with those notions of our our understanding of brachiosaurs where it's like okay they're they're clearly not a, a water dwelling completely dinosaur but they are showing it walking out of the lagoon so they're kind of like eh, 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 eh. yeah yeah it's a good homage so that's a good segue too <laughs> sir uh to a, you're right it's a small feature but as a dinosaur is tied for my favorite we had to include it here i'm i think which one is it which uh Jurassic park is it Stephen? where there's they're like trying to herd the dinos and the, uh, the Parasaurolophus is running by the Jeep and they're trying to like, I think, lasso it. Yes, that's the Lost World Jurassic Park. Parasaurolophus, hands down, is, is my, one of my favorite dinosaurs. And it's, uh, again, not to jump off of this film too much, but Parasaurolophus is in all five Jurassic Park movies. It's the only one that's in all five other than T-Rex and Velociraptor. That's, I like, that's almost evidence of like a very low key standum. Like, listen, I love this dinosaur. We got to put it in the movie, but it can't be like heavily featured. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, well, I mean, that's actually a good segue. Like, what do you think about it as a character? Like, or does it have a personality? Did it need to? Or do you think it's more just kind of like backdrop to show you the amazing diversity in dinosaur form? Like, what was I the point of including it? I think so. I think when, you know, obviously the sauropod and our next dinosaur are very much more of the emotional centers, but I think that idea is that the Parasaurolophus is always a good dinosaur to pair with other dinosaurs. I think the duckbill dinosaurs are like, again, my, they're probably my second favorite group of dinosaurs overall. Uh, shout out Chantungasaurus. Um, but like, yeah, they just, they're just a nice visual companion. And I think the idea, especially in the 80s and 90s, when people were like, even in the original Jurassic Park, they find clutches. That, I think that was like when they started finding clutches of like hadrosaur eggs, myasaur, edmontosaurus. Like, it's another way to like inject some of those theories of like the herding dinosaurs and like family. And it's just like warm, fuzzy feelings, you know, when you see a Parasaurolophus. Always. I, <laughs> Uh, quick sidebar, I just wanted to give a shout out to Megha, who is tuning in all the way from India. Potter loves dino. That is for you. Yes. Uh, all right. We're going to keep moving on. Also, a reminder, uh, all questions, please send them to Christina. We're going to get to those in a little bit. Um, I want to put up our poll that I just made, because now I'm actually very curious. Let's see if I can grab it here. Pull, pull, pull. <laughs> Boom. I would be shocked if this is below 90% in this room. I would be oh. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, like ten, trending toward your prediction here. Not shocking. All right, all right. I'm going to give you guys five, four. Keep voting. If you haven't voted, vote. Voting is very important. While we still have a democracy, you know, use it. <laughs> all right, 90, all right. So it looks like 94% of us in this room have seen Jurassic Park. Uh, the four of you who haven't, I'm very curious as to why, but you know, now you got something to do tonight. All right, um, <laughs> moving on, Stephen, pop quiz, what's next? We saw the Parasaurolophus. Sick Triceratops. Sick Triceratops. I have some theories about the sick Triceratops, but I just, at first I'd like to kind of hear your thoughts, Stephen, before I jump the gun here. Well, I think, again, it's, it's Spielberg and I think, Thinking about it more from the film perspective rather than the book, I think Steven Spielberg and the screenwriters were really trying to, because you have you have the the predators who are you know the monsters quote unquote, so you really had to kind of have a menagerie of herbivores to evoke the it's again this movie is like a balance of like the 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 sort of nature uh, you know 
kind of thing. And and Triceratops was another way of like, because again, Triceratops, it sort of resembles sort of s- certain mammals, uh, um, hoofed mammals and stuff like that. So it, I think it was, that's another sort of shortcut for the filmmakers. And, and showing one that's sick, I think that eludes another kind of emotional response from the audience. Um, but it, but I think having a Triceratops as opposed to like, say, a Stegosaurus or an Ankylosaurus or something, mm-hmm. um, it just very much, it resembles kind of mammals, sort of, but also it is foreign enough and like alien enough that like you kind of, it invites you in to really look at these animals, like to look at dinosaurs as animals rather than sort of legends or myths or things like that. It's like, no, this is a living, breathing creature. It's got gross stuff on its tongue. Its eyes are all watery. It's like, oh no, this is a real creature we're looking at here. Uh, so I don't, have you ever seen this image? This is from this behind the scenes during the original filming, Stephen. Uh, oh. they, yeah, they called me in for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, I actually, Steven Spielberg, Spielberg is in the back here. You can see him with the, the blue hat with the white rim. Oh wait, I think the, I think the is this pole in? Oh, the, never mind. The pole was in front of my screen. It wasn't oh. on the screen itself. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Spielberg uh, with the jeans and the blue hat with the white rim, right? Y- yeah, I think so. That I looks still, like... Here's my question about this scene. So they mention so obviously it's sick, and like it recurs every like six weeks or so. They also talk about the West Indian lilac and how they don't eat the West Indian. They know it's poisonous, but they don't eat it. So I had this theory, and again, I am not a woman, and I have very little understanding of how female bodies work. What if, what if, is it possible that this particular dinosaur was menstruating and like every six oh. weeks it became sick or had cramps and had to like chill out? I, this is a weird theory I thought of. I, I love that. And, you ever heard but, it, say but that? it, but um, it basically that was something that was originally like a big plot point in the book that they only allude to. And it was more of this idea. I think it's that some birds and maybe some mammals swallow stones to help digest their food. Yeah. Gizzard, gizzard stones, I believe. And so again, I think that was Spielberg sort of, okay, we've, we've seen the majestic Brachiosaurus. We've seen, you know, the the velociraptor you know ter- it's like it's it's we're like triangulating a ho- more holistic like complete picture of dinosaurs and it's sad because they they deleted a couple moments from this uh and and one of them is alan grant and ellie sattler giving each other a high five and i'm so sad that they cut that moment from the like from why the- wait why were they high-fiving because they figured out that the dinosaur was getting, that the Triceratops was getting poisoning because they were swallowing stones and then like pollen and stuff from the West Indian lilac was like, Oh, I like, you know, so that's how it was getting sick from it. Even though it wasn't eating the West Indian lilac, it was still eating stones that were around it. Essentially, I think is the- So nothing about either uh, being on its period or maybe even (laughs) pregnant and having like morning sickness. Although, I mean, you could make a case that maybe it even is alluding it to being, you know, life finding a way the dinosaurs are breeding. It could have been an early clue about that as well. So I think that's probably why Spielberg cut it in a way is like leaving, it's, it's not a big point of the story. It's more of just, there's something up with these dinosaurs. They're not just these manufactured creatures. They are alive. Uh, quick shout out to everyone in the chat, all the females in the chat who are just giving me like the rolled eyes, shaking head right now, which is, <laughs> which is fair. I never claim to be an expert in that type of stuff, just in dinosaurs. Uh, all right, it is time for the that piece of thought. What, what, Christina, go ahead. Sorry, uh, just talking about that type of stuff. Uh, my cat is also uh, popping off with fan theories here. So um, on, on Triceratops specifically, on the sickness? Uh, I'd love to hear a couple of those. Yes. So one I just added to the chat uh, from Michael. So it's related to one you mentioned. Yeah. Um, the sick Triceratops from a novelized version uh, had something to do with swallowing gastrolith, gastroliths mm. with the West Indian lilac on them. Oh. Because at first, like, if they're swallowing gastroliths, that's a normal thing to help aid digestion. Why would that make it sick? But yeah, with the different, like, literally alien to them pollen and spores, I can totally see how that could be a reason. I like that. And then uh, 
Jay Kanan, I'm sorry, I just see your at. Um, fun fact, the creature in the book was a stego, not a trike, and they were swallowing West Indian lilac berries along with the stones for gastroliths. Okay. Oh. So, I'll, I mean, I, I got all types of ideas going on in here and some questions starting to pile up for later as well. Good, cool. All right, so let's move it along. We got a couple more before we hit our questions. I'm going to share the screen one more time because it is time to meet, well, really the star of the show. The T-Rex. Now, as far mm. as the actual physical depiction of the T-Rex goes, it was, I think, slightly larger than we think they may have been, but not so much. Uh, I mean, not not large in the sense that they made it four times bigger, like the Mosasaur, <laughs> but slightly larger. Um, you can still you can see on the fingers here. They got the two fingers right. We know they were actually again clappers, mm. not slappers. So their hands have been facing in towards each other. We have no idea. Well. We don't have no idea. We have some idea, or at least some educated guesses as to whether or not T-Rex had feathers. We have never found federation or direct evidence of feathers in T-Rex, but we have found evidence of feathers in so many of its smaller, very closely related cousins. And just like we have not found evidence of hair on early hominids like Lucy from three million years ago, Lucy is an ape. All apes we know had hair, so it stands to reason Lucy had hair. So in my mind, it stands to reason T-Rex had at least some feathers. We don't have direct evidence of that yet, maybe one day moving forward. But this is like the original iconic introductory scene. And it's interesting, Stephen, because like you think of it as a monster and like the, mo like the Godzilla of the movie, but really it's almost like one of the heroes at the end, which we'll get to in a second. So what are your well, thoughts? I well, I think that that was really, I mean, the original ending, one of the original endings of Jurassic Park had, I think, Hammond or Grant driving a forklift into the T-Rex, which, it, or like um, a crane or something in it, into the bones. There's, there's some storyboards online of that original idea. But I think the Tyrannosaurus, because you have the cunning raptors, now you're, you know, you're sort of opposing it with pure animal instinct and the idea that this this dinosaur this predator can either be hunting you one second or could be you know saving you in another and it's that unpredictability of nature the idea that you can't you know you don't have you know you never had control that's the illusion <laughs> and i think the it's in that moment when the brachiosaur, you know, that's this kind of pure emotional awe sublime. But then when Grant gets out of the car and the T-Rex roars, I feel like you are never more, it, it's like seeing a tiger or a lion. To me, when I see a, a, a creature like that, I just have nothing but like pure respect and awe, but also I'm afraid too. And it's like kind of respecting that. And what I love about the portrayal of the T-Rex is that you respect the heck out of it. and. Yeah. You know, you you aren't going to think you're, even though the T-Rex maybe isn't that smart, you don't think you're smarter than it, you know. Ugh, turn the light so off. good. Turn the light off, turn the light <laughs> off, turn the light off. Uh, no, you're, I think you're absolutely right, Stephen, with respect to like the mix of emotions. So again, a uh, quick shout out to uh, C Jurassic Right. The very first episode of C Jurassic Right, your podcast, you talk about the first time, well, the first viewing, the first time your dad took you to see Jurassic Park when you were six? Yeah, when I was six, yeah. Is half as old as you should have been for a PG-13. <laughs> I, I know, you, I know. You do know. such a beautiful job of just, uh, describing like the crazy mix of emotions that, that you went through in this moment. And you just did it. Like it's fear, it's intimidation, it's awe, it's reverence. It's like, I'm part of this big, crazy picture of nature. I, this scene, I mean, it's iconic. What yeah, you yeah. But of course then we end with this scene where after almost being eaten, the T-Rex almost, well, is kind of the hero at the end of the day. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, I think it's purposeful that the, that the T-Rex defeats the raptors who stand for almost like the raptors are corrupt. It's like they're becoming more human, you know, and, and that idea of leaning towards Hum like being human in that corruption, whereas the T-Rex is almost like more pure because it's more like, you know, leaning towards nature and, and everything like that. I never thought about like the idea of corruption. It's almost like the raptors are to Nedry the way the T-Rex is to Grant. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. All right, um, so that's the T-Rex. <laughs> uh, we all know it, we love it. I'm wearing the necklace. Um, we got two more to hit real quick before we go to questions. 
Again, these are in order of appearance. So this is our Dilophosaurus. First of all, they made it twice as, I'm sorry, they made it half as big, unless it was a juvenile. And they allude to that, right? When it's like, you're not as bad as your, your bigger, your older brothers. What is the I line? mean, I, th I think, that, yeah, you're not as bad as your big brothers, but they could be alluding to the T-Rex and the Velociraptor in that too as well. So in, in real life, Dilophosaurus was twice as big. Basically, again, they inverted the size of the T-Rex. I'm sorry, of the Velociraptor and the Dilophosaurus. We know they had that like double mohawk crest, but there is zero scientific evidence for either the frill or the spinning. That's total creative license, but a very fun creative. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the Dilophosaurus truly was the, probably in their eyes at the time. I mean, obviously we talked a little bit about last night about how what is correct or what has aged well in Jurassic Park has changed over time as science discoveries change as, new discoveries are made the dilophosaurus it was like right out of the gate they're just like yeah this is this is pure cinematic license um and i think ultimately as far as its role in the movie i think it's i think there's like a funny idea of like this cute dinosaur being a killer and i think it was also just to mix up this idea because uh, velociraptor and t-rex are from the cretaceous and dilophosaurus is actually a jurassic predator and i think truly to round out the trio of, of predators, I think it was just, uh, again, this kind of idea of like the contrast and, you know, and, and the villain getting its comeuppance from the tiniest predator, which I think is very charming. Yeah. As, as you brought up a good point too. Like, I think we've talked about this before, but uh, Jurassic, it's called Jurassic Park, but almost all except for, I think two of the dinosaurs are actually Cretaceous dinosaurs. I um, mean, in the original, Brachiosaurus and Dilophosaurus, I guess, are the only Jurassic predators or Cretaceous dinosaurs in, uh, quite the same <laughs> all right last but not least and actually it's good i think they were ending with this because this kind of this scene and this dinosaur specifically was at least in their mind the most like realistic looking and the most bird-like and this mm. we talked about gallimimus we did a whole day on uh ornithomimosaurs and how we actually played this scene because it's my favorite scene in the movie and mm -hmm. it really at least in the public eye, started to kind of shift people's perceptions of dinosaurs as these cold-blooded, sluggish things, and much more active, warm-blooded, very closely related to birds, animals. And I think that, like, in a lot of ways, this scene and the movie itself kind of keyed this difference, this kind of uh, shift into thinking of anim dinosaurs, at least, as not so much this sluggish thing that's just like in movies or in a movie, but actual real moving bird-like dinosaurs uh, from which we can learn a lot about animals today and vice versa from. So do you, do you, how do you feel about this scene? And I mean, I, I, I love this scene and I think you, you bring up a really good point. It's like, and, and what's fascinated me like now, like looking back at all of the dinosaurs, like, or, or looking at Jurassic Park as a whole, it, it, I mean, some of the scientists, uh, some of the scientific discoveries, like I felt, I feel like Jurassic Park could be praised for incorporating ideas that were, that were pretty new at the time where it's like, you know, it almost takes pop culture time to catch up with like, what is the scientific reality? And so I think it, it, as far as like from a, you know, a non-scientist perspective, it's like, it, it, this feels like a call, like it's obviously there's no feather, you know, whatever, but all that stuff. But like, it's truly just saying like, here, you know, if you think it's, um, what's the name of the brontosaurus that like old, Kurt, like the Gertie. silent, Gertie. Yeah, it's like, it, like, <laughs> goodbye, Gertie, Ch drop kick Gertie yeah. out off into the sun. It's like, these are dinosaurs. These are- grandma on a rocking porch, uh, on a porch, like a rocking chair. In my day, we had Gertie. And the yeah, yeah. Ah, power cord, screw yeah. you, grandma. It's yeah. 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 You know, like, yeah, like the Gallimimus is, is truly, in the movie, it, it it's the last new dinosaur portrayed on screen. It, it you know, it's flocking like birds. Um, they're bird-like. There is a herd. There's you can actually see uh, a a couple of juveniles in the background in some shots. Oh, cool. um, you know, so it's not all uniform. And it and that I you know and also kind of the mix like this is the dinosaur in the movie that is kind of dangerous but isn't. Uh, exclusively a predator you know in that sense so i think it's again just adding another layer and you know again playing with those notions of and and why jurassic park is a p like um a pg-13 movie but it but more so it is a movie that is like truly like a family film that 
you know, at least like when people share their stories of listening or watching Jurassic Park, like on my podcast and stuff, so much of the movie people talk about, and it's not like this for everyone, but so much of what I hear from people is that Jurassic Park is a movie that you watch with your family. And so it's truly like a multi-generational experience. And I think that showing the Gallimimus in that way is kind of like, yeah, playing with those notions where we, where we push Grandma Gertie off of her rocking chair. All right. Uh, I, I brings me to this question. Um, what is the longest you've gone as an adult without watching Jurassic Park? Like how often do you do viewings? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. I, I mean, was to think about this too. I, I maybe for me, like, I don't think I go more than maybe six months. I, I'm not. Oh, for sure. Oh, de- easily, easily. I probably have it on in some form at least once a month. That's fair. Well, you're also that, doing research for stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it also, I mean, that and then including the other films. I mean, it's it's pretty much always on. In my... The one thing that we haven't talked about really at all, uh, which we could do a whole episode on, is the just the graphics themselves and how even now some, it was 1994, someone do the math to 2020, how many, 26 years, is that right, right math, 26 years? Since Nin- 93 to, yeah, 2020, that's 27? Yeah, so 27 years of improvements in graphic design and computer-aided design, and like, they still look great. Yeah, they, it holds up today because they knew their limitations and did not, I mean, you know, st- just like industry stuff, like, you know, things are done at the last second all the time. I think like one of the Lord of the Rings movies was being like rendered out and like finished as the theater, as it was about to play in theaters, like last minute, whereas Jurassic Park, the most last minute thing, which was changing the ending to include the T-Rex was I think like, they were like six months before there or like a year before, like, uh, do you think we can add the T-Rex at the end and do it? You know? And it's like, well, what, they, you know, what was the plan uh, other than them, the Raptor saving them from the Raptors and the, the banner falling down? What was the ending they were going to do? Th- that was the thing I mentioned about like either Hammond or, well, I think I'm, I'm mixing up maybe two options. I think one of them was like Hammond, you know, Rich Sir Richard Attenborough gets a gun and shoots the Raptors. And then I think, there was one variation where Alan Grant gets into a crane and like hits the T-Rex into the jaws of like a skeleton. So it's like the fossils killing the alive thing. So there was some stuff there, but thematically the ending that they came up with is just perfect. Right. Speaking of great thematic endings, uh, (laughs) Christina, we got some questions for Stephen, I am sure. We got about 10 minutes worth of questions. Let's do it. We sure do. I have, a lot of them here. Uh, I think this is a Zoom room full of Jurassic Park fans. Um, <laughs> For the four people who have not seen it. Yes, yeah, spoilers abounding. Uh, Rob wants to know, was the Velociraptor based on a dinosaur like Her- Herrerasaurus? Well, at least at the time, I believe, because Michael Crichton, he wrote the book. The original book came out in 1990, I believe and Deinonychus, is that how you pronounce that dinosaur? Was or Deinonychus, either way. Dino, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, like as a kid, I think I said Deinonychus, like, like it's very 90s sounding. Um, but yeah, I believe at the time, originally, I think either Crichton was deciding between Deinonychus and Velociraptor, but I think it was with a lot of cinematic or, or you know, literary, like, uh, fiction it's like kind of whatever is the coolest sounding but if you look at a lot of I, th- I believe if you go back to a lot of like early concept art and stuff for the movie it's kind of like inter- they were kind of like interchangeable but obviously because Dinonychus is a little bit is is Dinonychus a little bit bigger than a regular vo- than an actual velociraptor oh, so the velociraptors in the movie like they're actually Dinonychus size yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of almost like they kind of blended the two. Yeah. It, 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 just looking back at their notes, kind of. So yeah. Although I would love to see a Herrera source in Jurassic Park. That would be awesome. Facts. Facts. <laughs> um, so uh, you posed the question earlier about sauropods and herbivores in general. Like, what is it that people love about them? Why are we drawn to this? Uh, Catherine addressed that and said. Uh, my thoughts about Brachiosaurus and Triceratops uh, tugging at the heartstrings. They're the one everyone knows. Adults probably recount them as one of their first love type of dinosaurs. 
kids know them, they're herbivores, and it's hard to make meat eaters appear gentle and majestic. <laughs> And I, the sheer scale of Brachiosaurus is such a wow factor. That's, you know, and I didn't, I mean, we, Dustin and I joked about Gertie, but I mean, truly some of the earliest dinosaur depictions in pop culture were sauropods. So, and triceratops as well. Like, uh, I forget which dinosaurs in King Kong, but I think it's a triceratops or maybe it's a stegosaurus, but like, or Fantasia has stegosaurus. That is so uh, scary. He, yeah, the Fantasia is very scary, but uh, yeah, that, that's such a great point. It's those are those those shapes and imagery has been long established in Jurassic Park in a way is like paying homage to the legacy of dinosaur representation in pop culture. Yeah. So that's great. I love that. Um, Natty asks, T -Rex, are T-Rex a scavenger? T-Rex are a scavenger, not a fighter. So is that one thing they got wrong? Because they only fight when they need to. And Natty brought up bees as an example. Ooh. Like they're not gonna chase you unless they're provoked or something like that. So where do T-Rex fall? That, so that was gonna be my question to you, Dustin, and, and is that as far as scientific discoveries, which, which Jurassic Park got right and which got wrong, it seems like since since Jurassic Park and even within the, the film franchise itself, they've changed their mind in the lost world. There's a moment where they, you know, cause in Jurassic Park, T-Rex can't see you if it, if you don't move. And then in lost world, they're like, that's ridiculous. And it's like <laughs> scientists actually said that, you know, T-Rex was most likely a scavenger. And so that was in like 97 when lost world came out the sequel. So that was something that seemed to be a big debate in the 90s. And I guess, yeah, my question to you, Justin, is has that changed? Where does T-Rex fall now as I mean, a scavenger or hunter? We don't know. <laughs> we, you know, it's funny because we, we've talked before about how like warm-blooded versus cold-blooded isn't an actual dichotomy. It's more of a spectrum. And for most animals even today that we call hunters versus scavengers, it's usually somewhere in the middle. Maybe they're primarily mm. hunting or primarily scavenging but it's impossible to know for animals that lived that long ago. And all we can do is think about, well, what do we know about how this thing was shaped and how it may have moved? And so like for one, uh, we know they're a lot slower than they were depicted in the movie. So that gives credence to the idea that maybe they were only scavenging. I mean, we know they were eating not only dinosaurs like Triceratops, we have evidence of them scavenging or eating other T-Rexes. We just don't know mm. if maybe, you know, if you kill one in a territorial fight, it's a free meal or you come across one that's dead it's hard to know and it's hard to know and i like that like we've mentioned multiple times from multiple dinosaurs jurassic park kind of like plays that thin line between what we kind of know and what we don't know and allows people to come to kind of their own conclusions and thoughts about them but we're, we're mm -hmm. just not sure mm -hmm. uh danelle asks in regards to the dilophosaurus frills and spitting tar what or rather is there any animal they are modeling these features off of I believe they, there is the frilled lizard, which is, I think, an Australian lizard. If I'm, oh, I'm getting a thumbs up from Catherine, an Australian <laughs> lizard. And the spitting, does the frilled lizard spit blood out of its eyes? Is that the, there's like a lizard that spits blood out of its eyes. Different. I think the bearded dragon does, no, it's gotta be some, some lizard <laughs> does that for sure. But I, and that and that speaks to a point of when they're trying to when they're trying to bring the dinosaurs to life on screen, a lot of the behind the scenes involves the makers talking about looking at animals in real life and looking at different, you know, analogs. And sometimes it's not always, you know, it's, it's not like accurate, obviously, because, yeah, who knows if we would be able to know, like, how would it be interesting to know how would you find fossilized evidence that a dinosaur could spit? you know, poison or what, like, how would you find that in the fossil record? But I think it's, uh, that was just, that was probably, again, I think I mentioned before, like at the time that was their most like, yes, this is creative license where the rest of the movie, they're like, no, we're, 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 we're doing science right. But the spitter, they were like, yeah, we're just having fun here. Having fun. Oh, nice. yeah, let's do uh, one more and then we got to go through this Brachiosaur paleo art gallery. Yes. Okay. Oh my God. I'm so excited. Uh, first let's of all, get ready, buckle up. Cause these drawings <laughs> every day blow my mind. We have some <laughs> tremendous artists. So Christina, go ahead. Yeah, uh, first of all, this little scorpion says the blood eye guy is the horned toad lizard. Oh, okay, horned yeah. toad. Um, 
So Catherine asked, curious if there's any papers or documents about the cultural influence Jurassic Park has had. I saw it the first time today and noticed an awful lot of ideas, particularly around captive animal care. Mm. I mean, that's a great question. I wonder, I'm, I'm sure there's been more academic looks at this movie. And I mean, because, you know, it's a fun talking head thing to do. I mean, it, I feel like every paleontologist probably gets asked about Jurassic Park. I, I will say one of my favorite paleontologist discussions about Jurassic Park, um, I'm going to make a wreck. Uh, Dustin, I don't know if you've listened to this. And if anybody else has listened to this podcast, shout it out in the in the chat. It's called The Common Descent. It's a it's a really amazing podcast. These two paleontologists, they just talk about different topics, Mary Anning, Spinosaurus, Amber, different extinctions. Like every every 10 episodes, they talk about a different extinction. And their top their discussion about Jurassic Park right at the very beginning, I believe it's episode 23, I think is a really good discussion about this idea of is uh is it is it is it pop culture and like fiction's responsibility or where does their responsibility lie in depicting dinosaurs in this case accurately and where the kind of the the positives and the negatives of that and they use kind of jurassic park as a case study of like well here's these positive things that have happened because of it maybe more funding for paleontology and research this kind of uh bringing to light the warm bloodedness and these kind of new discoveries dinosaurs are not just like you know gertie sorry sorry gertie um and then but also like the negatives of like yes but they're also getting these things wrong and i think as to paleontologists, I think they were, it's, it's not this idea of like, eh, the book was better than the movie. It's, it's very much, the, it was this very much this measured approach. I don't know if it, it, and it's not necessarily based on like data. It's just these two paleontologists talking, but kind of through their own personal experience and their own uh, journey, you know, at becoming paleontologists. I think, I think they were able to balance a lot of things. And I think it makes for an interesting discussion at least of, the sort of impact both positive and negative Jurassic Park has had on the field of paleontology and science in general. So shout out to them. Common Descent Podcast. Common Descent Podcast. I'm gonna look that up. Um, a couple orders of business. Uh, if you guys want to support this that we do literally every single day, uh, you can throw me a couple bones uh, on Venmo. <laughs> I'm Dustin hyphen Growick. If you want to follow Steven and all of the cool work he does, I'm sharing the screen again. This is all his contact info. Uh, these are all the podcasts that he brings to life. I'm a huge fan of all of them, actually, and of you, Thank Steve. you. Uh, Steven, are you ready to go through these paleo art? Yes, I'm ready to see some beautiful paleo art. All right, so before we do that, I just want to show you this last picture because whenever I see this, randomly I laugh. Uh, this is a depiction of the browsing range of <laughs> brachiosaurs, which speaks to the fact that if your body's that big, it takes lots of energy to move. It's easier to stand in one spot and just sweep your neck around. I like oh. that the big inner balls specifically. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, hold up your drawings. We're gonna go through the gallery. Steven, feel free to comment on this beautiful art as we go. Uh, Jada, oh, that is cute. Bucky, the bucktooth brachiosaurus. Oh. Okay. Into it. It's like a cow. Oh, I love that. I'm very happy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, all right, Catherine, all the way from Australia. Clever, <laughs> clever girl. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, wait till you see this. Ashley goes crazy. Oh, oh hey, man. SSDGM. That's so great. Oh, it has a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Again, speculative. Uh, Agus is working <laughs> on a, a beautiful post-it note gallery on the wall. Whoa. Right? Oh, that's so rad. Yeah. I, again, every day, very impressed. Margo using, I believe, Procreate on the iPad, spared no expense. For wow. Brachius. Oh, my gosh. That's a bingo square, by the way. Spared no expense. Spared no expense. We got a clever girl shirt as with Barry the Brachiosaurus. Top notch neck. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. Look at that. Uh, Manny Brachio. I like that. I, like ooh, that. I love the colors. That's really yeah. cool. Wordplay. Here for it. Martin. Look at Martin's head. Wow. Uh, I, what are what are the name of those little spinely things that they've been showing on a lot of sauropods? Oh my goodness, I'm forgetting the name. They're extensions of the vertebrae. Oh wow. Neural are they called neural spines? Am I 
My, I'm seeing a thumbs up from Michael. So yes, ne- we're going with neural spines. All right, let's see what other drawings we I got. I love those. Um, Yasmin, hold that up. Becky and oh, <laughs> Becky. Becky, Dylan, and Darren. I like that. I like <laughs> the whole fam. True um, Jurassic family over there. Right. Oh, we have Judith another. Has taken a bunch of notes as well. Love this. Bert- Ooh, I like this. The spots that kind of reminds me of Mr. DNA. Yeah, I, <laughs> I forgot about that. Bingo. Patrick made a brachio. Oh. Brachio. I like the uh, the frog, almost Kermit-like color. I was, I was thinking avocado. Avocado, <laughs> it does look like avocado. Uh, Bridget <laughs> with the Crystal Park dinos behind. I like that. That's oh, nice. That's nice. Ooh, so love Rivers, that. Rivers and Zella always have great ones. It's, I, there's a lot oh. of that happening there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's extra. Now with even more neck meat into it. Um, <laughs> Hell yeah. Heck yeah. Ooh. Ooh, I love that. Yep, Sky Boy. It's good. It's good. Virginia. Beautiful. Virginia. <coughs> oh, look at that. I got, I like the sun. Got the trees. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Even Is that the tree they were in when they got sneezed upon? It looks like it to me. Maybe. You got that branch out there. You could perfectly like, no. Uh, Shout out to Laurel, who I believe is zooming in from the back of a van. Shouts to van life. Uh, wow, look at this. Brachiosaurus girthy. Girthy the brachiosaurus. Girthy, oh my God. Let's, let's keep it PG here, Em. Let's keep going. We got Megan uh, with... <laughs> oh, look at that dog. Look the at that. Dog make the drawing. <laughs> Neck Nicole Cole Cole Kidman. Kidman. Wow. Yes. Wow. <clears throat> so great. Uh Bubby. Yeah. Natty. Oh, by the way, Natty is one of the only people who's ever gotten 10 out of 10 on Dino or Not a Dino. Shouts to Natty. Wow. Alan and Ellie. Oh, that's <laughs> Aw. That is Frickin very- beauty. All right. We got a couple last ones. Preventoraptor. <clears throat> Neck meat. Neck meat. People Ooh, you got the people looking in awe too. It's a nice contrast. All right. Nicole Kidman. Okay, <laughs> Not over it. Christina, I, I can't find your, your square. Where'd you go? I'm right know. here. I know you saying I'm right here doesn't really help me. <laughs> there you are. Christina, okay. um, any final last thoughts, words, questions before we bounce? We're slightly over time, but it's Jurassic Park. I don't care. <laughs> uh, oh boy. I've just been catching up in the chat with everyone who has uh, questions and things to share uh you rock if you have additional questions you guys can always hit me up or steven at any of his platforms again he's just at steven ray morris anywhere Mm -hmm. Uh, tomorrow we have a very special surprise i'm not going to tell you about you guys just have to trust me that tomorrow is going to be great thursday again we do this every single day but for now first of all steven thank you so much for joining us Uh, we could have done this for hours on end but i guess that's why you made the podcast (laughs) yes the the nice thing about podcasting is uh it's there's no rules in that sense and look i could talk about this all day so this was a blast thank you for having me on of course thank you so much for joining us uh you guys i don't care if you're scrolling through all of your podcasts to find see jurassic right or simply reaching down in the bottom of your giant tub of popcorn while watching jurassic park never stop digging thank you again to steven thanks christina you guys are amazing paleo artists i will see you tomorrow peace out never stop loving dinosaurs bye everyone Bye.